Hi, my name is Clark Gelling. I'm a fellow at the Electric Power Research Institute. I was asked by the University of Minnesota to help with a series of lectures relating to this project. And the series that I've uh, been asked to do are uh, ones on demand side management. And this is the first in that series of lectures. Demand side management is a, a concept that we use in power system engineering to uh, uh, include all utility initiated activities that are directed at modifying the way consumers use energy. Basically, to modify the consumer load shape, either the pattern and or amount, to achieve utility objectives that are in concert with customer needs. It includes planning, evaluating, implementing, and monitoring functions in order to achieve these objectives. Now, you can think of demand side management as providing a mechanism to find a balance between traditional so-called supply-side management, or SSM, cost, both fixed and variable, and what might be uh, aggressive actions on the customer side of the meter to encourage changes in the amount and pattern of energy use. Typically, uh, the, the concept uh, basically is that we can probably do without building some of the supply capacity that we've traditionally built and without potentially uh, installing some of the transmission and distribution capacity that we've traditionally built by injecting a mix of demand side management activities. And I've defined that here very arbitrarily as a least cost range that is to suggest we can't satisfy all needs for electricity by, for example, energy efficiency, uh, nor, can we, nor should we supply all needs for electricity simply by building generating capacity and transmission lines and the like. But actually, there's probably a combination between these demand side and supply side costs called the least cost range that would be ideal both for the consumer's perspective and for society's perspective. Now, in addition to demand side management, there are a number of other factories that in, uh, factors that influence system load shape. One is naturally occurring which is to say uh, there are changes that are made because consumers buy new appliances and devices. Uh, they might be because of uh, increasing growth in a hot area like in the southeast or in the California valleys where naturally the building has to have air conditioning. That will change the pattern and amount of the total demand for that region. It might be appliance and equipment turnover, buying new stuff, replacing old, the new being more efficient and sometimes carrying with it a slightly different pattern of demand. It might be reactions to energy prices. As we all know, consumers react to prices. Prices go up significantly, they cut back, uh, and that could be uh, one of the changes that occurs in the load shape. Or it could be regulation, the promulgation of, uh, for example, federal appliance efficiency standards or a state uh, regulation or standard uh, would change how uh, electricity is used and therefore a change in total the load shape uh, and, and, and with it uh, the obligations that the utilities would have to serve that new resultant load shape uh, from, from consumers. Um, what we found is that demand side management can't just be accomplished by arbitrarily saying, oh, I like that one and let's do all of this. Instead, we really have to go through a systematic decision-making process where we specify objectives identify alternatives uh, that would help us uh, look at a, a combination of supply and demand objectives, evaluate and select programs considering both utility and customer actions. On the customer side in particular, considering both what's called acceptance and response. Acceptance would be, I will join or I will buy that appliance. Response is what they then do with it, what actually the resultant pattern of demand is uh, that results. On the utility side, that could well be the load shape impacts from utility actions or the mix of generation that they might have now or could modify for the future. And out of those two, we do a cost-benefit analysis and make comparisons, choose programs, potentially implement some of them, and then, of course, monitor the performance of the program with an idea towards uh, modifying the original objectives in kind of an ongoing uh, integrated resource planning process. There's three tier of, of objectives that need to be specified in this simplistic view. One says, okay, I've got a strategic objective of either improving cash flow or reducing earnings, reducing risk. 
or I have there, therefore uh, a tactical objective which derives from those, which might be to defer the construction of a generating unit, to increase system utilization, or to reduce the dependence on critical fuel. Uh, and if I sort through those, I probably will come up with what I've uh, decided to categorize here as six possible uh, load shape objectives, uh, peak clipping, valley filling, load shifting, strategic conservation, strategic electrification, or flexible load shape or reliability, as I may call it later. Uh, and, and let me go on to define those just a little bit better for you. Peak clipping is uh, the idea of reducing what would have been the demand for electricity at the time of system peak or, it, it, or seasonally reducing it. And that has certain impacts on uh, the, the need for capacity and the like. Filling valleys to make better use of my assets improves load factor. And that could be by promoting the use of new uses but only off-peak um, or adding new industrial load and adding that off-peak. I could shift load by moving load from daytime to nighttime, for example, and that without a net increase in electricity demand would help me make better use of my assets. Energy efficiency certainly is a demand side management objective, as are beneficial new uses where, in particular, I'm implementing fossil fuel uses of electricity, which displace, uh, uh, which, which, which is this fossil, I'm implementing, excuse me, electric uses, which displace fossil fuel uses, and therefore reduce CO2 emissions and have an overall positive impact on the load shape for the utility involved. Or I could, I could impose flexible reliability, where I'm controlling appliances and devices in a way that enhance the overall reliability of the power system in that region or area. Uh, I, I want, want to highlight for you that three of those are now called demand response as this uh, discipline has evolved, new labels creep in. So peak clipping, load shifting, and flexible reliability are all, all called demand response. Uh, and the idea in demand side management is to find a sweet spot between the things that utilities need in order to survive and prosper and the things that customers need in order to satisfy their needs or reduce, uh, uh, you know, at, at a reasonable cost. For the customer side, reducing costs, serving energy, maintaining lifestyle, and overall satisfying desires, or even increasing the value of service they get is highly important. We can accomplish those, and if we can find the things that we can do, which at the same time help the utility reduce capital requirements, improve financial performance, increase system utilization, and uh, reduce critical fuel usage, uh, they will all benefit mutually the customer and utility, and by the way, uh, probably enhance the image of the utility and the industry overall as well. Uh, one of the concerns and considerations for demand side management is that we typically uh, don't have the same depth of uh, information as we do on the so-called supply side uh, 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 management alternative. For building a new generating plant or um, buying and having one installed, I've got lots of good information on cost and capacity over a range of options, reliability and performance, uh, and there's no problem at all in, from a technical perspective in choosing which one I want to buy. On the demand side, it's a different story. On the demand side, I've got very little good cost information. And I've got these two huge uncertainties I've already mentioned of response and acceptance. C consumer behavior is, um, is, is difficult to predict. But we obviously need to do some prediction in that regard. Uh, but it's, uh, it's complex. It's hard to understand necessarily how best to motivate consumers to do something that might benefit us jointly. But, uh, and so for that reason, the data on acceptance and response is a bit weak as is, therefore, the performance history of various demand-side alternatives. I might say, though, with the uh, enormous increase in interest in this topic, that's changing uh, rapidly. Uh, what, what, I, um, what we're finding that we need to do once we understand what our objectives is, and we have identified what are at least a pool of demand-side management alternatives, is we need to go through a, selective proce a selection process to evaluate those alternatives. And that could be just intuitive. For example, that it's so overwhelming that we know that replacing incandescent lamps with compact fluorescents is just a question of can we construct a program to get, you, get customers to do it. 
uh, in a cost-effective way. So there's really no issue as to whether it works or not. We might have a more complicated program or set of technologies that we want to see customers implement. And they would require a more aggregate analysis. And now we're probably into the use of some kind of computer system to do power flow analysis and to understand what the impacts are on the system uh, overall. And that can also, of course, lead to a much more detailed evaluation, which, which includes doing a fairly robust market analysis and understanding uh, the impact on load shape over time or over at least the, the time of the planning horizon. Once that change in load shape over time has been estimated, that information can be inputted into the traditional utility planning process. As I said, one of the issues is, is here is with regard to customers and their behavior. And that, that really, that behavior uh, derives from their preferences. Here, here's a chart of residential customer preferences come, that came from a rather extensive body of uh, work that was done. And it, it, you can see the importance of variety of these attributes uh, ranges from their uh, primary interest in low energy bills and increased comfort all the way down to potentially wanting attractive, hassle-free, and uh, hassle-free and high-tech appliances. The mix of these, that is, uh, choosing an appliance or device that we're going to promote with a customer that does one or more of these or all of them, the mix of those is what's really critical. Uh, and finding how utilities and customers might settle on what those the mix of those uh, basket of technologies are is very difficult. I might also highlight in this case that these questions were asked independent of uh, suggesting that this is about electricity. This is uh, overall what residential consumers are interested in when it comes to their energy purchase decision, whether it's electric or gas or, uh, or, or potentially even anything else. It's more complex when you turn to the commercial building customer. And in this case, just looking at uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, or HVAC, as we say in the, in the trade. Uh, and here, uh, there's a series of things that, uh, no surprise, have cost and comfort on the top. Uh, but have a number of other attributes, which the combination of which is very difficult to define. Particularly, note here that there is in, in these uh, surveys, there was no overt preference for energy types. They're not coming in saying, I want electric. Uh, they are inclined to choose what works best for them. And they thought, we have achieved some of our load shape objectives from an electric perspective, for electric planning perspective. We are interested in promoting an electric appliance or device, potentially. And so, so it, we have to understand what the competing device or appliance is. So the overall energy efficiency, uh, or even energy consumption uh, influence diagram really has a, a, quite a complex set of actors. Everything from uh, my own organization, the Electric Power Research Institute, Department of Energy and the like, as well as what the utilities are doing to come up with programs and the consumers, and how they're reacting to those programs, ultimately leading to their consumption or their purchase pattern of demand. Take any one of those and change it, that is to modify it, thinking of a, of a demand side management program, and you begin to uh, enter a world uh, which is a fairly complex one in terms of evaluation. I have a short quiz for you here. Um, so uh, I'd like first for you to think about which of the following are included in demand side management are energy efficiency, load management, valley filling, load shifting, heat clipping included, or all of the above. And of course, if you chose all of the above, you're correct. Second, if properly designed, who benefits from demand side management? Customers benefit, utilities, society, regulators, or all of the above? Well, really all of the above benefit. Regulators perhaps indirectly, but certainly Customers, utilities, and society benefit from increased satisfaction, improved performance of the overall energy system, reduced cost, and often reduced impact on the environment. Thank you for being with me.